okay? Yeah. Okay. How's your stomach? Have you found anything to... Ah. Uh, it's gone. Yeah? Yeah. I, I finally have been prescribed the right stomach medicine after six years of being in constant pain. Finally, within, I haven't had a stomach problem for like over a year now. Yeah. Did they finally figure out what it was or did they just finally... No, they never figured out what it was. I mean, most gastrointestinal doctors don't know anything about the stomach diseases. They just, they just have a PhD. You know, they get paid a lot of money for pretending and prescribing you different drugs, and um, they—it's uh, a—it's a total scam, as far as I'm concerned. Because I went—I've been going to doctors for six years, and and I've tried every drug available, except for this one last one that's brand new, and it finally worked. And it—it uh, it can't be. Um, what do you call that? I mean, it isn't. What? Placebo? No. <laughs> no, it can't be. Um, it isn't a s specific stomach ailment. It doesn't have a name or anything. It wasn't a matter of finding out what disease I had. It's just, it's, you know, it's psychosomatic. It's, it's part of my nervous system. It's part of, you know, there, I mean, there are millions of people all over the world who have irritable bowel syndrome. And that's, that's the common term that all doctors call a stomach problem and they just say oh you have irritable bowel syndrome but I can't fix it you know I don't have anything to fix it but you know there's just a variety of um, of ulcer medicines that can slow down ulcers you know and eventually heal them but I didn't have an ulcer I just had a red irritation in my stomach you know but I was in pain I mean I was in pain for so long that I didn't care if I was in a band I didn't care if I was alive you know and it just so happened that I came to that conclusion at a time when my band became really popular you know I mean it'd been going on and and building up for so many years that I was you know suicidal I mean I just didn't want to live so I just thought if I'm gonna die if I'm gonna kill myself I should take some drugs you know <laughs> May as well become a junkie because I felt like a junkie every day, you know, you know, waking up starving, tr forcing myself to eat, you know, barfing it back up. It's like, you know, just just imagine trying to eat your three meals a day and just just concentrating and just crying at times, just like Ugh, I'm in pain all the time, you know. And being on tour was a lot worse too, you know, it made it even worse. So when when did they? How long have you been up and in pain? What was it? I know you just said it. Like, when, when did they find the, the, medic, the medicine that picked you up? About a year ago. That's good. Yeah. Um, I want to go through some uh, your memories from the, the videos that you've made from shooting them. Um, and actually, the only thing that I've heard in any of you say anything, that any kind of disappointment about any of them was Smells Like Teen Spirit. That not <clears throat> turn out to be exactly what you thought about it. Yeah. I mean, it. Although it worked, I mean, I liked the video overall, but it it wasn't what I pictured in my mind. When I come up with an idea for a video, I want it to be translated exactly how I see it in my mind, and it just wasn't that way. I mean, we didn't we didn't take enough time. We didn't prepare ourselves enough to have as much control as we wanted to, you know, and. Um, I just remember walking in the day of the shoot and looking at the set because I had, you know, had meetings with Sam Bear and um, I told him what I wanted. I drew pictures of it and I walked in and it wasn't what I wanted. You know, it just it looked like a Time Life commercial to me. You know, with that backdrop, it just looked like such a contemporary. You know, you know those kind of commercials where people are sitting there, you know, trying to sell aspirin or something or. You know, an AT and T commercial. That's what it looked like to me. It looked too contemporary, and but um, still, the kids made the video. You know, and I had to like, even after Sam had edited it, he edited it and um, sent it to me, and I didn't like it, and I flew down at the last minute to L.A. and and edited it myself. I, I threw in a few extra things, which pretty much saved it because um, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I mean. 
there were a lot of really there was a lot of really good footage that wasn't used and if a lot of that wasn't used it would have been a really bad video. <laughs> Crowd stuff, you mean, and the kids going crazy. Yeah, there. yeah. There wasn't really a lot of that, and most of the stuff that was used looked really contrived. It didn't. It would, there was no spontaneity in it, so I just threw all the spontaneous parts in. Um, and I was and then. Well, I guess after that, um, you did a, a, a couple with Kevin Kerslake. Um, <coughs> what was now the only? I guess the the blues and the purples and your faces being. A, a, um, distorted was was the only thing you really wanted from Come As You Are. Is that true, or was it? Are the biggest things that you were concerned with? with that? Yeah, I mean, those were the biggest things. And um, you know, I wanted baby underwater, and I just wanted a, a water effect. And um, overall, I'd say you know a real large percentage of that was exactly how I thought of it in my mind. And but he came up with the idea of the. Um, the actual set, you know, with the stairs and and the chandelier and stuff, and it just it just worked out perfectly. I mean, it's really good. It's great to work with somebody that can come up with their own ideas too, and just surprise you, you know. And then and not only come up with the same exact vision that you had, translate that, and then throw in their own ideas, and that works even better because then you have more things to work with, you know. What, what was yours and what was his? Do you remember what you suggested and some of the things he surpassed you with? Well, he basically just came up with the set, the, the stairs and um, the chandelier, yeah. the set itself. Yeah. How long did you have to swing from the chandelier? Mm, quite a few hours. Yeah. 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 Um, and lithium was originally going to be a, a pretty elaborate, I don't know, I guess concept video with some, some pretty elaborate ideas you had for it, right? Yeah, it's just that we we failed to hire um, some some puppet people. I, I guess that's what you'd call them, people who who do animation and and use puppets in time to be able to finish it to to get it out in time of the release date. So we just scrapped the idea. Actually, we just put it on hold and. Um, we're still working on it. We still want to do something with puppets. Um, at the time, I wanted pretty much a, a, a rip off of the Brothers Quay. You know, not a rip off, but you know, using the same imagery. But um, because I, I make dolls, I've been making dolls for years, and it just turns out that those are the dolls that I make are a lot like Brothers Quay dolls that they use. And when I first saw their short films, I was just amazed. It's like, God, this is the neatest thing I've ever seen. You know, that's my mind, you know? And um, it was just, um, you know, it was just put on the back burner. But we're still working on it. That'd be cool. Have you seen that Tool video? You know, I, oh God, I hope they get sued. You did a great job ripping them off, but it is so... It is such a rip-off. Yeah. It's, it's a shameless rip-off. Yeah. I mean, I wanted a Brothers Quay style, but I didn't want anything like that, you know. That, that was terrible. I mean, it, it's a neat video. It's really nice to look at, but I mean, I'd rather watch a Brothers Quay video, you know. Yeah, God, I mean, even, even down to, like, stuff coming through windows on walls. Would be like yeah, so, uh, meat going through tubes, and, yeah. I mean, pipes, and, oh, shameless. Yeah. You'd be slapped on the wrist for that. Um, and can you? I mean, no, no one's ever going to hear what I'm saying, actually. So if you can just kind of explain how the the idea for In Bloom came up and, and who that is doing the Ed Sullivan bit. You know. Oh, who is the the guy that? Yeah. Oh, that's that's Doug Llewellyn. The guy in the In Bloom video is Doug Llewellyn from the People's Court. He's the MC or whatever you would call him. He's the guy that talks to the people after they win or lose. You know, he interviews them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was it was my idea to come up with that. I I um, thought I want to do a, I want to do a video that's either from I, I wanted something that looked like it was off of live television from the late fifties or early sixties, and I thought the best way to do it instead of trying to reproduce that effect with new film, I thought, 
I asked Kevin, are those kinescope cameras still available? And he said, yeah, we can get them in Hollywood. You can get anything in Hollywood. So it just worked out perfectly. I didn't think we'd ever be able to actually find those kind of cameras, but we did. And that's another video that just came out exactly how I wanted it, just perfectly. Are we going to take the video? No, I'm sorry. I was just saying that first part of the answer was kind of rough. Oh, okay. So all right. Second part of mine. Um, was there the other thing that the, the thing that struck me the most about it the first time I saw it was um, some film I've seen of when Elvis was in a lot of trouble for his, <coughs> his pelvic thrusting and when they shot him just from the waist up and. Then he went on to Ed Sullivan, and Ed pulled him aside and said, this is a perfectly nice fella, you know, and all that, and all of a sudden his problems were over and he was okay. Was that uh, sort of in mind with what was going on with you guys? With the three perfectly nice, clean-cut young men? Mm, I, no, I don't remember ever seeing that Elvis thing, but I think, God, what was the story about that? I think it was just that I was talking to Kevin about it, and I said that I would like, him to say something about how nice and clean cut we are, you know, how perfect we are, because, you know, the In Bloom video came out at the height of us being thought of as degenerates, you know, so, you know, we, we needed a, a light-hearted video, you know. That's why I asked, it seemed like an odd parallel from what I've never seen from the Elvis stuff. Mm. How did you end up doing three versions of it? You were going to do, you had planned on doing two, right? Was there a third one? Well, I mean, maybe that's just something I know because I know there was one there. But there's one that's all dresses. There's one that's all in in the suits and stuff. And then there's there's the one that's the mix that I guess got played the most. Mm, I don't know anything about the one that was just all suits. I think Kevin wanted to do one with just suits, but we I never I've never seen that one. I don't know if he actually made one or not. Because all I know about it is the one with the dresses and the one with both of them. Mm. They probably never made one for you. Mm. Um, now, was Sliver supposed to, I know that was down in your garage or something? Yeah. In the basement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that, um, I don't know, maybe I'm high thinking this, but I thought I heard somebody that that was supposed to replicate an old um, rehearsal space here or something? Or? No, um, it just, it turned out that um, it looks a lot like my old apartment in Olympia because I, I used, um, I had moved all my stuff. I had my, um, my entire apartment, all the stuff from my apartment from Olympia stored in a storage space for the last two years and I brought it up to the house when we moved into Seattle last year and I had all this stuff in the basement and so I set everything up exactly how I had it in my apartment in Olympia. It was a, it was just weird deja vu to see that. How did, uh, how did Frances Bean survive that? Was she kinda... That's just, that's just, um, trickery that's yeah. just we she wasn't right in the middle of us dancing around and throwing things you know we we shot us dancing around and then we put her down and then like just drop paper around her you know and then edited it together to make it look like she was like at our feet yeah. <laughs> it just seemed like an obvious thing to do since she was there in the house and stuff or was yeah like she was there i was babysitting yeah. <laughs> um so when you went to do Heart Shaped Box, did, did you plan on doing that with Kevin, or was it? did you decide you wanted to go with someone else from that from the beginning? Mm, I'd rather than answer that. Okay, that's cool. Um, did you, did you um, collaborate with Anton a lot on a lot of the ideas? And Actually, how did you, why Anton? Um, well, we, we met him a few months before we, we did the video, or before we decided to do the video. Um, he did a photo shoot for us. And um, he, he was just such a nice guy. And then I saw, I think it was a New Order video. And um, I wanted to work with somebody that was a, a photographer or an artist this time. I just wanted to make sure that the visuals were going to be really stark and vivid, you know. So that's why we chose him. Yeah, he's great. He's a really great guy. Whose idea were the, uh, the hanging fetuses and the organ woman and, and Santa and the cross and all that stuff? All of it was my idea, except for the large woman. You know, that was Anton's idea. And that was just another thing that he just threw in. You know, he didn't even, we didn't even talk about that. It was just, he just happened to film her one day when we weren't there. And uh, it, was, it was incredible. I mean, it turned out so great. 
uh, like I was saying before, it's really great to work with somebody who has their own ideas, you know, because it, and not only can you translate exactly, I mean, that, that video has come closer to what I've seen in my mind, what I've envisioned, you know, than any other video. I didn't think it, was, it would ever be possible to come that close, you know, it was just perfect. I think I've drained myself on video ideas. I don't even want to try to reproduce something like that again. Is it a lot of work for you? A lot of work, yeah. Oh, definitely. It, it's mind-boggling. It's just, um, I don't know, it's just, it's a really detailed medium. It's just, there's so much to it, you know, and it's so, it's so fragile. You know, you could really screw it up. Um, now, you're not, you're not going to make a video for all apologies? You're just going to put the unplugged? I just haven't to bothered to come up with any ideas lately. I've been on tour and I just, I haven't been thinking of anything other than just concentrating on touring. I, I just don't want to bother with it right now. I don't really see the need to put out more than one or two videos for each record anymore is basically a waste of money because everyone knows we have a record out, you know. And if we're going to sell some more records based on the next video, then those aren't people who want to listen to our album anyhow. They bought it because of that video or that song, you know. And, um, you know, I just want to sell albums to people who really like us and who already know about us and already like us, you know. So, I don't see any reason for it. I actually don't want to do any more videos, but I've got a few ideas for, for Rate Me, and we want to release it as a single, so we, we might do something with that. Do you want to talk about that at all, or do you want to save that for Ah, we'll save it. Yeah. Was, was All Apologies going to be the next single anyway? Because that, I mean, of the, of the Unplugged stuff that I've seen, that's, that's one of the ones that I think fits the Unplugged format. The best was was that the reason for it, or were you planning on putting it out as a single anyway? No, it was going to be the next single. I don't think it was the best performance off the unplugged thing. But that's just my opinion. I, I don't think it was that good, really. We've played that song a lot better before, but but I see what you mean. It does fit. Yeah. It could work really well acoustically. Yeah, I, I don't mean that particular form performance necessarily. I just mean I think if you mm. listen to to the four discs worth of stuff that you've got, that's one of the ones that seems like, if, if you hadn't seen you guys do it yet, listening to all of them, it would seem like that would be one of the, the biggest, most likely candidates. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you talked about um, how before how you weren't particularly crazy about the way a, a lot of the, the production ended up for, for Nevermind or something. Did that affect the way you um, went into your utero at all? Um, I think it had a little bit to do with that, yeah. And we just wanted to make sure that it wasn't as commercial or slick sounding. And the main reason is not, it had nothing to do with wanting to alienate people or, you know, it had nothing to do with that. We just wanted to make sure that we put out a record exactly how we want it. We wanted to put out a record that we would listen to at home you know and we don't listen to very very many bands that are produced the way nevermind was produced although it is raw by comparison you know to most other commercial rock records you know it's still we don't listen to that kind of music so i mean i really can't think of any other band besides REM that that has that kind of production that i like you know so is that way you know, something actually that surprised me that I didn't know that Chris said earlier is that you um, actually originally were thinking about Steve Albini for Nevermind. You know? We've been thinking about Steve Albini forever. We've been wanting to have him produce us for since around Bleach. Actually, if we could have if we could have gotten him for Bleach, we would have done that. But we couldn't afford it at the time. I don't think. No, I guess that isn't the right answer. I mean, I, I'm sure Steve has done yeah. bands for nothing, but we just didn't think he would like us at the time or something. I don't know. The, fir the first thing that I thought of when I heard that he was producing it was just trying to think of the way you guys sound with Surfer Rosa. And I just thought, wow, this is going to 
great. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I thought, too. I just thought it was the perfect sound for us, because when I heard Surfer Rose, I thought, that's exactly how I want my band to sound. That's how I've always wanted our band to sound, but we've never been able to capture that sound, you know? It just it was just a coincidence that 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 um, he he produces records like that. You know that's what I've heard in my head for years. You know that that kind of snare drum sound. You know, I think the big and, and maybe only um, criticism that he gets from the records he produces, and and it's odd because the the big black records and the rape man records, the vocals are right up there and they're really really loud and they're one of the most prominent things in the records. But the criticism that he's gotten is that the vocals were always too low. No, I agree. I think uh, almost every album I've heard him produce that he's produced, um, it ha always has the vocals too quiet. He's not much of a vocal man, I don't think. And we're a very vocal-oriented band, so it was kind of a struggle to get the vocals loud enough for him. So there were, there were discussions about that then? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're always asking him to turn the vocals up more. It was kind of a fight. So why was, um why was Scott Litt brought in for it? was just the two songs, right? All, all apologies. And yeah. Um, well... They just didn't seem finished. Or it? It's, they just... I don't know. I mean, we listened to In Utero for about two months after it was finished. After we finished it with, with Albini. And... Listening to this, the album over and over again, it got a bit redundant. That drum sound is a bit overbearing after a while, and so we didn't want the entire album to sound like that, you know? We, we wanted something different. And um, Scott was available, and, and we love the production of R.E.M. stuff, so we just thought, let's, let's try Scott. And it, and it turned out great. I mean, he's one of the greatest people I've ever worked with. I mean, it's so easy to work with. It's, it's. I want to do our. We. I think we all want to do our next record with him. Yeah. Um, also, for the first time on this record, um, you know, you guys are, are, are officially credited and, and are officially writing things. I know you guys had always. You came with the sort of the guts of the song, and you always built it up and, and sort of put it together as as you know a band. But they they're actually credited. But did did um, Dave come up with the riff or song, songs to practice? Mm, yeah. Yeah, he did. He came up with the do 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 that part and the drum part. He came up with the drum part first, and then and then he came up with the guitar part. But I, I came up with all the other guitar things over the top of it, everything else, the lyrics and singing and everything. You looking at? I hope that happens a little more in the future, or is it? Yeah, sure. I, I'm all open for. I'm open for relieving myself of any kind of songwriting you know I, I, I'd, I'd be great if Chris and Dave could write more songs uh, what's that? Yeah.